This video is on building design intent in assemblies in Creo Parametric. This is a lecture only presentation. There is no demonstration. Let's talk about this thing called design intent. If you take a look on the graph, this shows how the cost of implementing a change increases along the life cycle of a product. Making a change is relatively inexpensive in the early stages of concept and development, but as you start going into prototype and production, the cost of change increases throughout the lifetime of that product. And so, the initial design phase is only a small portion of a product's life cycle. You might spend just a few hours or days building a part model. You might spend a few days or weeks working on an assembly. You could spend months or maybe even a few years developing your product, but your product is going to be around typically for many years, maybe even decades. So again, your design phase is just a small portion of the product's life cycle. You actually spend most of your time making changes to your models. For example, as you're designing, your product requirements might change. You might have peer reviews where you identify different things that need to be fixed. You could have change orders and change notices that affect your product as a result of prototype and testing and manufacturing. And once the product is released, you might get feedback from your customers or from the field that tells you that you need to make some different changes. And so therefore, since we're actually spending most of our time making changes to our products as opposed to the initial design phase, we want to build additional information and additional intelligence into our models. And that way, when we need to make a change, those changes are going to be propagated throughout our product into the other parts and assemblies in ways that we plan for and ways that we expect. This is design intent. In assemblies, there are four different ways of building design intent into your models. First, the choice of your base component. Second, how you organize your product structure. Third, the constraints and connections that you use. And fourth, top-down design. The important thing about building design intent into your assemblies is that better choices lead to better models. And what we mean by better models, we want to create assemblies that are parametric, that are flexible, and are robust. When choosing your base component, there are a couple considerations that you want to take into account. If you can, you want to select as the base component or the first component in the assembly, something that is indicative of the overall size and shape of the model, especially if you have something that you can mount all the other components on. For example, if you are designing an automobile, this might be the frame of the automobile. Second consideration, you want to choose something that's hopefully going to be very stable because Changes are propagated in our model through parent-child relationships. If you have to make a lot of changes to the base component, those changes will be propagated to the other parts and assemblies inside of your assembly. And so you want to choose something that's hopefully not going to change that much because the ch those changes could end up resulting in regeneration failures. By using these two different considerations, you will reduce the chances of regeneration failures and make your model more stable. Also, always assemble the base component. A very common mistake, mistake, especially amongst newer users, is that they don't assemble the base component. And the overwhelming majority of the time, probably 98% of the time or more, you can use the default constraint for the base component, which will align the component's default datum planes with the assembly's default datum planes. Second method of building design intent in the assembly level, the product structure. And your product structure is how you organize your assembly into sub-assemblies and even local groups. And so some of the different tools that you have for defining your product structure in Creo Parametric are, 
the assemble tool, which will allow you to place the component in the assembly and define its constraints. You can also create components in the context of an assembly, like creating individual parts. You can create subassemblies and skeleton models. The include command in Creo Parametric allows you to add an object to the product structure without adding the component's geometry. And again, this is often used just to define the product structure, to have your bill of materials correct. Later on, as you are developing the product, you can edit definition of that component to add constraints, and it will no longer be included. It'll be an actual component, and you will see its geometry in the graphics area. And a fourth tool for defining your product structure is to create bulk items. And bulk items are actually created from the create component dialog box, just like creating parts, subassemblies, and skeletons in the context of the assembly. And bulk items are for things that you want to re represent in your bill of materials, but you're not physically going to model. For example, these can be things like paint, oil, other lubricants, or even things like staples or, or carpet. Again, stuff that you're not physically going to model, but you want in the bill of materials. So let's talk about how you organize your subassemblies, how you choose your product structure. And if you take a look at the images, these are some common industry verticals for Creole Parametric and CAD modeling in general. So in the upper left, we have aerospace and defense. In the upper right, we have medical devices. In the lower left, we have automotive. And the lower right is consumer electronics. And one thing that I recommend that you do is take a product from each one of these verticals and start considering how you would define the product structure, what major subassemblies you would use. And so when you're choosing your product structure, some of the different considerations that you can take into account are location. And this could be physical location. Let's take a look at the example of the aircraft, the fighter plane, in the upper left-hand corner image. So for the location of the components, maybe you're going to organize your subassembly into different areas like the fuselage. And you might break down the fuselage into the nose, the tail, and the main body. And maybe another major subassembly you would use is the cockpit and other different sub-assemblies would be for the wings. So that's a way that you could use the physical location for defining your product structure. Another consideration that you could use is function. And so it could be the functions of the components in more related to Creole Parametric. So for example, you could have them broken down by structural, electrical, piping, and mechanisms. But another option that you could use in terms of organizing your subassemblies would be by the products function. So again, for the example of the aircraft, maybe you're going to have different subassemblies for the power plant, for propulsion, for navigation, for payloads and weapons, for communication, so forth and so on. A third method of organizing your subassemblies is doing it by installations. In other words, when something is going to be assembled, how are you going to organize it that way? And that one method is very commonly used for routed systems. What I mean by that are things like piping for hydraulics or cabling for your different wire harnesses. Maybe you're going to have separate major subassemblies for those different components, reflecting how those different entities are going to be placed into the product. And another potential choice is organizing by your end items that you're getting from your supply chain. So again, for example, with this fighter jet, Maybe the radar is being created by a different division within your company, or maybe you are getting that from one of your suppliers or subcontractors. So you might have that radar installation organized in its own separate sub-assembly for how you're, again, organizing your product structure. And I want to make clear that you're not going to choose just one of these methods. You're going to probably use a variety of these different methods 
at different levels within your model. But the important thing is to give a lot of thought into how you're organizing your subassemblies. What makes, makes logical sense and what is going to facilitate the implementation of changes later on. Third method of building design intent into your assemblies is by the choice of constraints and connections that you make. And so you typically use constraints when you have a component that is static, a component that is not capable of moving in the assembly. And with your constraints, you're typically adding enough to eliminate all the available degrees of freedom. All components have six degrees of freedom, three translational, three rotational. You use your connections for the components that are capable of moving. So for example, if you have one rotational degree of freedom, that is a pin connection. If you have one translational degree of freedom, that is a slider connection. And there are a variety of different basic and advanced connections that you can choose. So let's talk about some do's and don'ts regarding your selection of constraints and connections. And these kind of line up between a bullet on the left-hand column and a bullet on the right-hand column. So first off, any component that isn't capable of moving, if it's static, it should be fully constrained. It should not have any degrees of freedom remaining. And a corresponding don't to that, some people, again, leave the first component unconstrained. And you can tell it's unconstrained because it'll have an empty box next to it in the model tree. That little symbol is called a glyph. And then all the other components will have a double empty box next to them in the model tree. That indicates that they are assembled to an under-constrained or unconstrained component. So again, most of the time, you can use the default constraint for your first component. All right, second of the do's, any components that are capable of moving should have mechanism connections. You should use those pin, slider, cylinder, planar, ball, bearing, so forth and so on that reflects the available degrees of freedom. One of the don'ts corresponding to that is that sometimes instead of using mechanism connections, people use component flexibility where they'll have different dimensions when the component is assembled reflecting different positions like fully closed or fully open. Another bad habit that people sometimes do is they use an overloaded bill of materials. In other words, if a component is usually in one of two different positions, they'll have that component assembled in there twice. It'll be in the initial position and the final position. And don't do that because that really screws up your bill of materials. All right, third of the do's. You want to reflect how the component would be assembled in the real world. You want to take some time thinking about that. And one thing that I mean with that, a lot of times people say, hey, whenever you are assembling components, use your default datums if you can. Assemble things to those and it'll be more stable, lower chance of regeneration failure. Personally, I prefer to use model geometry if I can, because again, that reflects how something is actual, actually going to be placed in the model in the real world. Because when we are assembling stuff in the real world, we don't have these imaginary datum planes or datum coordinate systems. Uh, the third don't, don't assemble a component to another component outside of the current subassembly. Everything within the current subassembly should be standalone. You shouldn't have components assembled to external references outside of your current subassembly. Fourth of the do's, you want to make sure that you use constraints that will update the component's position accordingly. So for example, if you have that jet plane over there and the jet plane has to get two feet longer or two feet shorter, you want to be able to make those changes and then have everything move appropriately uh, in the rest of the assembly. Now, one thing that I see people do, there's a technique that people talk about for making 
uh, assemblies as stable as possible. What they'll do is they will as assemble a component using constraints, and when they've got it in the right position, then they will delete all the constraints and then add in a fixed constraint so the component is in the right position in space. And that way, there is not going to be a chance of a regeneration failure for that component's position in case something else in the model changes. But again, the problem with that is it defeats our design intent. It does not make our model parametric. If you have everything assembled with fixed constraints and then you have a change like, hey, our fighter plane needs to get longer or shorter, you've got to edit definition of all of those components, reassemble them, and then probably do that boneheaded thing of deleting the constraints and adding a fixed constraint back in there instead. Don't do that. Use real assembly constraints. A, another good do is something called design in context. And that's a situation whereby you need to design a component based on other components in the assembly. So you can create the component in the context of the assembly. You can capture some of those necessary design references using data sharing features like copy geometry features and shrink wrap features and then design the component accordingly and by using those data sharing features if the rest of the assembly ever changes then your component will update accordingly now the bad habit that other people do is they figure out sort of similar to the previous don't of using the fixed constraint they'll figure out where is this component supposed to be in the assembly in space and then they'll figure out okay based on these xyz coordinates of where the component needs to be i'm going to define my first feature out in space and so that way when i go to assemble the component then i can use the default constraint it's automatically going to be located in the right position and a lot of times i refer to that as designing with a universal coordinate system so that in each individual part model the geometry is out in space relative to the default datum planes and default coordinate systems that is a very 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 bad habit because again your model is not going to be parametric you, that's the opposite of building design intent into your assemblies all right fourth and final method of building design intent into assemblies is actually the best method and it's called top-down design top-down design is the best way to balance control creativity and speed into the development of your products because those three different qualities are often competing against each other and you want to find the right balance you don't want to be heavily skewed one way or the other because it'll end up being at the detriment of your product and your product schedule so in a nutshell with top-down design what we're doing is we're consolidating important design information at the top levels of our assembly whether it's our top level product or one of the end items and the two main tools that we use for doing this are skeletons and notebooks skeletons will contain any geometry that controls multiple different components in your product so for example in aerospace this might be your oml or outer mold line if you are in consumer electronics this would be your industrial design and your different major sub assemblies would have their own skeletons where they're leveraging some of the information from the top level skeleton and then so forth and so on you'll have skeletons on down your product structure as necessary with your notebooks, those will contain any important dimensions or parameters that affect multiple different components. And then we share the information from these skeletons in notebooks using data sharing features for sharing the geometry and declarations for sharing the dimensions and parameters from the notebooks into the individual parts. And the whole notion of 
using this top-down design is when you have to make a big change, then you make that change at those skeletons or those notebooks. And then when you regenerate your assemblies, those changes are going to be propagated to all the different models that are connected via data sharing features or declarations, and your product will update automatically for you. And so again, top-down design is the best number one way of building design intent into your assemblies. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this video and this lesson. And again, it's all about making better choices because better choices lead to better models and better products. For more information, please visit www.creowindchill.com. If you learned something from this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you like this video, please click the subscribe button and ring the bell to be informed when new videos are uploaded. Thank you very much.